folks, John here with Hickory Forge. Welcome back. If it's your first time here, welcome. So what's going on today? I'm out here in the workshop. We're getting moving on a pretty simple project. This is going to be for March's quarterly Patreon giveaway. I know it's late. March was just a really stinking busy month. But anyway, what I want to make is a, a pretty simple Damascus knife, but I want to make it out of ladder Damascus. And uh, we're going to talk about that right quick before we get moving. So if you've never made ladder Damascus, it's pretty simple. Uh, you just go ahead and start with your billet. We're starting with 16 layers. This is a pattern that tends to look better at a higher layer count. So we're going to cut and fold this or restack it four times. That'll give us 256 layers, if I'm not mistaken. But basically, you just forge weld it together, draw it out, restack it, do that again and again until you get to the layer count you want. And then what you do is you put grooves in it. Now, the grooves, you can either forge the grooves in and then grind the billet flat, or you can grind the grooves in and then forge the billet flat. But the goal is to cut through the layers and then bring them to the surface when it's forged out or ground out into a bar and whatnot. And you get this kind of linear ripple effect in the steel. That's what we're going for. And uh, the gentleman who actually won last quarter's Patreon giveaway, Joe Garrard, a uh, real nice fella. He, he won the kitchen knife. But we got to talking, and he ended up making this. Uh, he's a machinist, and he made this set of ladder dies specifically for me. So that's pretty stinking cool. So all we'll need to do... We'll forge weld this baby together, get to the layer count we want, and we can forge the grooves in, get a really, really nice consistent groove pattern. Should make some really pretty steel. And then just grind it flat and uh, go from there. As always, our first step with Damascus, we've gone ahead and ground all the mill scale off all the pieces, so we got nice clean welding surfaces. But we'll tack this guy together with the welder, weld the work peg onto it. I mean, there really ain't nothing to it. We got our billet tacked up. It's looking pretty good, just about ready to go in the fire. While I'm over here at the welder, I've gone ahead and gotten started making the die plates uh, for the ladder dies. Basically, it's pretty simple. I have a Riverside Machine 24-ton press. They have a quick-change die system, so all it really is is just a flat plate with a little catch on one side. It just slides in and out. You know, there really ain't nothing to it. So uh, right now, it's all just tacked together, so we'll get it welded up proper and be good to go. Alrighty, so before we go in for the first forge weld, all I've done is take a nice kind of dull red heat on the billet so it's not scaled up too, too bad, and go ahead and throw some flux on there. This is just plain old borax. Uh, it's sold here in the U.S. as a detergent booster. There has been some talk going around lately of using alternative fluxes like kerosene or WD-40 or what have you, and uh, some people say they work, some people say they don't. Uh, I've never tried. The thing is, I know borax is going to work, and it can be hard on your forge, but I actually put a sacrificial fire brick in the bottom of my forge every time I go to forge weld so I don't got to worry about it damaging the lining too too much uh, but like I said you know there's like 50 or 60 dollars worth of steel here or what have you so like I don't feel the need to introduce an unnecessary variable that could lead to failure by trying to use an alternative flux that I don't know will work when I have something I know will work so uh that's all there is to it and if you're wondering about this high speed little tool that I use for sprinkling my flux on uh it's actually a thing, I don't know what it's called, but it's for putting powdered sugar on cakes. Uh, I borrowed it from a girl I was seeing and then she dumped me, so I never gave it back, but it works good for this. So the initial forge weld is done now. Uh, I've taken two welding passes on the press. I basically just did the same thing you just saw again. Uh, at this point, there's no need to keep brushing and fluxing it. You know, it's either going to weld or it's not going to weld. And uh, this is behaving as one piece of material. It's looking good. It's feeling good. So we'll go to the power hammer and draw it out to get some length and let it cool, grind it clean, cut it, restock it. That'll do it, really. Alrighty, here we are at 16 layers. It's looking pretty good. I don't see anything wrong with it. We got our welding surfaces ground clean, so we'll stack that bad boy back up, weld our work peg back on, forge weld it back together, and then uh, we'll have 32 and we'll keep going. Like, if you've been around the channel, you've seen me make, you've seen me do this quite a bit, and it can get kind of boring and monotonous, and it's not really going to get interesting until we actually get to our final layer count. So we'll come back when we got 256. Alrighty, a few folds later, we got this guy taking up the layers. So we got 256 right now. I'll go ahead and start to draw it out a little bit. We want to bring it to about twice the finished thickness that we want before we go in for the patterning with the ladder dies. So what I got going over here is a little piece of half inch square in the, uh, the, the press to act as an impromptu kiss block. We'll bring it down to a relatively uniform half inch thickness. And then we'll run it through the ladder dies and go from there.
So there was a bit more of a learning curve than I thought there would be using those ladder dies, but we got it done. Next step is to go ahead and grind the billet flat. I've already done one side. And then once we get the other side ground flat, we are going to need to change the dimensions a little bit because this is the knife I want to make. This is a pattern of one I made a few years ago that I like so much. I made a pattern. But it's a little bit too short, a little bit too wide, so we're going to bring it in, lengthen it out, so on and so forth, and uh, then go stock removal from there. Alrighty, we got that baby forged out. We got plenty for the blade now. I might be able to even upscale the blade a little bit, but uh, that's really all there is to it. So we're gonna let this guy cool, draw on it with some Sharpie and get to cutting. I went ahead and removed a good bit of the material with the porta band. It probably would have been just as fast just to take it to the grinder, but I wanted to save these to throw in my cutoff can to make fossil Damascus later. So there's that, but we'll dress this guy up and keep moving. So I've got my profile struck in. It's looking pretty good. Next thing we gotta go through and do is thin this baby down. It's still about a quarter of an inch thick, which is way, way more than I need. This is a pretty small knife, so I'd like the finished thickness to be a little under 3 16 or so. So now we're just working on thinning this bad boy down. Alrighty, we got this guy blanked out. I didn't go too, too far with the bevels. I want to leave it nice and thick to hopefully avoid any problems in the quench. Next thing we got to do is file in our sharpening notch right here. All that's going to be is just going in here with a little round file and putting a notch right there. That'll make getting in this bottom quarter inch or so with a sharpening stone a lot easier. Then we need to go ahead and take the flats up the grits a little bit so that um, after heat treat, I don't have to grind through my mark to get down to a nice clean finish. Drill some holes in the tang and that's all there is to it. After the quench, this guy was tempered for two hours at 400 degrees twice, so we should be good to go. Pattern's kind of starting to peek through, so that's kind of neat. But next thing we got to do is just go through and take the flats up the grits, uh, dress up the profile, grind the bevels in, you know, nothing to it really. You've seen me do this a million times, so I'm pretty sure you know what's what by now. So we got this guy taken up the grits. We got the edge down to final thickness. It's looking pretty good. Next thing we need to do is go ahead and make and contour the scales and everything. I'm actually going to try to get a good finish on this blade, a good etch without doing any hand sanding. So after the scales are fitted and contoured and everything, I'm gonna use Scotch-Brite belts to get a nice clean satin on this and then see how the edge comes out. If it looks like crap, we can always go back and hand sand it, but uh, let's make some scales. What I've done here is I went ahead and started the first hole. 
put a pin in, went ahead and started the second hole, put a pin in so everything's nice and solid of where it's going to be, started the third hole. So now I'll take all this apart and drill my holes all the way through the block. And then I'll take this bad boy to the table saw and rip it down or do a set of scales. And whenever we go to assemble everything, all the holes and everything will line up. So, you know, another tour really. And now I got a nice flat matching set of scales, you know, no two really. Next up is to go ahead and contour the scales to the profile of the knife. So I've got where the fronts are going to be marked out. We'll dress up this end back here, take the scales off and then clean it up and put them back on again to make sure everything's looking good before we bend the lanyard loop and everything. Whenever you're doing this style of blade, um, you know, in general with full tang knives, you always want to finish sand the fronts of your scales before you put them on because you're not going to be able to get to them when they're on the knife. But whenever you're doing an integral lanyard loop like this, you got to do the back end too, but uh, that's really all there is to it. So at this point, it's just a lot of taking the scales off, doing a little bit of grinding, putting it back on, seeing how everything looks so on and so forth but we're looking pretty good so we'll go ahead and uh, contour and finish sand the fronts finish sand the back bend the lanyard loop and uh, keep moving so we hand sanded the fronts of the scales and put a nice chamfer on them uh, they've been taken up to 320 grit so they're looking pretty nice gone ahead and got the back end dressed up as well uh, just whenever you do a full tang knife, you always, always want to have the fronts done before you put your scales on because, like I said, once they're on the knife, you're not really going to be able to get in here and finish them too, too good. So uh, next step, let's go ahead and bend this lanyard loop. Alrighty, we got the lanyard loop bent. Uh, in case you were wondering what's been going on with that little rat tail this whole time, that's what I was getting after. So now it's time to finish the blade and everything and get it ready for the acid bath. And like I said, I'm gonna try to do this without hand sanding. So I have a medium, a fine, and an ultra fine scotch bright belt that I'm gonna try to get you know, a relatively clean finish on the blade and see how the acid bath looks. And if it looks like crap, we can always go back and hand sand it, but that's what's happening now. So here's what we got after going up the grits with the scotch Bright belts. You know, it's definitely a nice satin finish, but it's not as clean as a hand sanded finish. 
But I mean, if it looks just as good after the etch, you know, that's pretty neat because, you know, this took 10 minutes versus the couple hours it would take to sand the blade by hand. But it's been degreased, uh, so we'll just wipe it off, throw in some acid, and check out our pattern. So this here is after two 10-minute etching cycles, and it's looking really stinking good, actually. What's really cool about the ladder pattern is it almost creates the illusion of depth or shininess. It almost looks like there's waves in the steel, so that's pretty stinking cool. I believe the artistic term is chatoyance or something like that. I don't know exactly what it means, but that's what it's called. But that's after two 10-minute etching cycles, and it's looking pretty stinking good. Like I said, it looks... It's hard to objectively say without having a hand sanded blade and a belt finish blade next to each other to compare. But I mean, that looks pretty sticky good to me. So we're going to do one more cycle to get a good deep edge and really, really bring that pattern out and uh, throw a handle on this bad boy. So here we go after one more etching cycle. It's looking pretty sticky good, actually. You know, I think the belt finish is a win. You know, it's I'm also kind of really amazed at the um, the depth and movement kind of going on in the steel. It's very, very it looks alive almost. I was recently asked on one of my social media pages kind of what the point of Damascus steel was because in practice it's no better or worse than modern blade steels. But uh, it's just a show of skill and effort on, on behalf of the smith and every Damascus blade is truly one of a kind. So how stinky cool is that? So now that the etching is done, it's time to get the scales glued onto the knife and everything. Quick tip um, for mixing up your epoxy and whatnot. Next time you're at the grocery store, buy you a pack of these little plastic shot glasses and some popsicle sticks and that's like three or four bucks there and that's going to last quite a while so every time you go to mix up your epoxy to put on scales you're not searching for a scrap piece of cardboard or some kind of crap like that so just a cool little trick to know So we got the handle shape roughed out. Uh, next comes the hand sanding. After all that, we got a real nice little uh, 256 layer ladder pattern, full tank fixed blade. My main goal with this project was kind of checking out the new ladder dies and getting the hang of them and seeing what kind of pattern they would produce and how it would look. And uh, I'm really, really sticking out with it. Like I talked about in the video, the pattern in this steel, it's a bit hard to capture on camera, especially in here where the lighting is so harsh, but the pattern in this steel is just awesome. Uh, camera really doesn't do it justice. And this is just a style and size of knife that I really, really like. If you ask me, this is kind of the perfect size for an all-around general purpose belt knife. Something you carry on a day hike or maybe like an overnight or something like that where you have an axe to accompany it. Obviously, you're not going to be chopping any trees down with it or anything like that. But uh, the handle, just plain old African black wood, some copper pins, nothing fancy. The integral lanyard loop, this is something I've been asked about a lot every time I've posted. And it looks like it's really complicated, but it's actually stupid easy like I showed you. And uh, it's just something that really adds a lot of creative flair to your fixed blade knives. So just go ahead, throw that in your toolbox, and uh, use it when you want. As sad as I am to see the knife go, you know, like I said, this is just one of my favorite styles of blade, and the pattern looks amazing. One day, maybe when I'm rich enough to afford some of my own work, I'll make one for myself. But this here is for March's quarterly Patreon giveaway. I know it's late. One of these days I'll be in time, I promise. But we got our trusty... Wheelandnames.com pulled up. All the patrons, your names are on there. So let's click to spin this baby. Robbie Roberts. So that's all I got for you. Robbie Roberts, if you want the knife, it's yours. Just get in touch with me on any of my social media. Links in the description. My email will also be there if that works better for you. But just get in touch with me. Give me your shipping info, and I'll get this guy sent out to you. But that's all there is to it. Uh, thanks for watching the video. If you like what you saw, like, share, subscribe, all that jazz. 
Always more cool stuff coming. Not always in the time lease manner, but there always is more cool stuff coming. Links to all my social media down in the description box below if you want to follow me. Instagram is where I'm the most active, so if you want to stay up to date with the day-to-day -day goings on here at the shop, that's the best place to do it. I will be at Blade Show in Atlanta in June hanging out. Uh, me and my dad will be there. I'll have a whole slew of hammers ready to sell off. So uh, if you want to pick one up in person, we'd love to meet you. But that's all I got for you. Y'all yeah, uh, take care.